I think we are live. Let's see. We are live without uh, any viewers yet, but that's okay. okay. We're going to go ahead and get started and, uh, you know, maybe people will tune in and see the recording once it's up. Uh, sometimes people will join a little bit later once they uh, get the notification that, uh, that we've gone live. All right. Well, so tonight this hangout is uh, featuring my friend John Belowski, who uh, has come on tonight to talk about his experience a couple of years ago. I guess that was uh, back in 2015 when he called into uh, the Mark Sargent program and uh, that recording became what's known as an interview of a uh, career land surveyor and, uh, you know, emphasizing the fact that, uh, that, they, that surveyors do not measure curvature. So John's going to talk about this and uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, take it away, John. Talk about your, your, your career experience, what you've done, and, uh, and then this experience here calling into the Mark Sargent show. Well, I, I did a little over 30 years in commercial construction and did layout and surveying for all the projects I was on and uh, got real familiar with the instruments and laying out some coordinates and uh, locating points. And um, I, I heard this, uh, I watched this video that Mark Sargent had on about the flat earth and uh, I I thought it was a joke, actually, <laughs> and uh, he wanted the information, and I was bored living up in the mountains, so I, I called him. Where where were you living at the time, John? In Colorado, um, in Ridgeway, Colorado, and uh, so I, I called him. And... Um... And, and you're saying that you had not heard of the flat earth up until no. that time? Okay. No, it, it was something new and I thought, I thought it was a joke. So kind of like liar's poker, I got my surveying book out and was thumbing through it as I was talking to him. And he wanted to hear about the plane and plane surveying that we don't deal with curvature. And so I kept talking about that and it, it seemed to excite him that we never had to figure in curvature for a small project. And um, then, then I, I always kept hinting around talking about the geodetic markers that I wanted to check between them and how did the numbers, how, how, how do they work and is it the curve forced into the plan or is that the way the numbers come out? And at the very end, I, I told him I want to check between two of those markers, thinking that that would, you know, entice people to get interested in surveying, to learn more about it. But it kind of backfired and, and nobody got interested. They just went, oh, guy says so, must be true. So, uh, Evidently, nobody got any more in depth in it. There was no questions, and just people were using that as an example of just what I said as being being the truth. When I was I was kidding him. <laughs> right, and the the thing is, is uh, you know, you were telling the truth that on a small project site, curvature doesn't come into play at all. Um, so. So there you have it. I did back then. I did hear part of the interview. I'm calling it an interview. That's what he called it. I uh, what, did he ask you many questions? I mean, as an interview, he would be, I guess, asking questions. But uh, do you recall what he was asking you? Well, he didn't really ask much because I kind of just kept reiterating. I never, never used the curvature formula the entire time, and I didn't need to. And I didn't get to get into the part where I didn't locate any control points that I had 
uh, engineering companies with people such as yourself come out and put in the stake out the control for the project. That I'm not a land surveyor, I can't do boundaries and all that, and I needed somebody to give me the get go. I call it the get the, the starting starting point, somewhere to start from. Actually, yeah, I mean that's uh, that is the way it goes. Uh, you were working for a contractor construction company, and and that was your world, and that's what you knew to construct the improvements on site, whether it was buildings, storm structures curb and gutter, what you name it, you're right. Oftentimes, it, I mean, it is commonplace that the contractor will call surveyors in. F for for one thing, it's probably the same surveyors that surveyed that property to begin with to set the corner markers, do a topographic survey of the property. And then, and then that information is given to an engineer who designs the site, whether it's a gas station, a shopping mall, apartment buildings, you name it. And then it goes back to the surveyor to uh, come out and stake that out. And in, and oftentimes the surveyor is staking it out for a contractor, but sometimes the contractor, as in your case, uh, just asks for some control points to get started from. And, and I guess that's how you guys were operating. Right, right. I mean, Within the company, we could have the license surveyors, and everybody was capable, I think, you know, but we just, we didn't take that responsibility. Okay. So you're right. Afterwards, I mean, I guess, did you, did they tell you that you were being recorded and that it was going to be put on, on air or on the internet for people to oh, listen with Mark, to? With Mark Sargent, yeah, I, I figured it was. Well, you figured it. I mean, did he? Were you informed that it was being recorded and that it would become an uh, uh, something on the online? Well, he said it was being recorded, but I didn't know that it was going to be broadcast like that. I didn't think anybody buy it. But okay. Uh, All right. So that was your introduction to Flat Earth and and your introduction to Mark Sargent and his program. So you hadn't seen any of his other shows before that is that the case no just one or two and i thought it was strange he put his phone number out on the internet so i i used it <laughs> first to see if it was real and by golly it was but but I, i'd like to say one thing though with all the projects i worked on i kind of disregarded actual coordinates after i got my stake out i would convert everything and set up two offsets on the drawings at 5,000, 5,000, uh, 1,000 and west. So everything the north and east coordinate and convert all the dimensions to the coordinates of 5,000, 5,000. All right, so, so you I, converted it into a local system on site. Right, because I wasn't dealing with anything outside the boundaries. Right. So it was it was easier to get. I didn't have to deal with magnetic north or what it, looking north. I just used my my baselines. Right. The coordinate system itself defined your orientation. And exactly. exactly. And it was easier that way to just have all my coordinates on column my column mark and everything. It weren't diving measurements, you know. Understood. All right. Uh, that's probably, I don't know. If, is there anything more to say about the interview? I keep calling it the interview um, or yeah. that pr program. I, I kind of related it to uh, going to see a psychic. I went to, my cousin took me to a psychic once. And every time I would say something or every time they would say something and I leaned forward a little bit to listen, they would run with it that, oh, that's what they want to hear. Let's talk about that some more. Well, with Mark Sargent, I could tell when he got a little giddy or excited. So I would go on with a little more of what I was talking about because of his excitement. Okay. So you were just joking. You were having some fun with this. Well, yeah, because I mean, 
I kept mentioning over and over again the geodetic markers everywhere. And they have meaning. And I already knew that they're, what is marked on them is accurate. And they're far enough apart in places where it would take a lot of work to actually do a, a level circuit between them. I mean, it, it takes a lot of work to do this. It's work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got that right. It, it's not as easy as what everybody thinks. So oh, just do this, do that. Well, just to shoot to drive a hub in the ground with a sledgehammer is a lot of work. Yep, and uh, it's a lot of yeah. There's a lot of stakes to be driven. Um, they haven't they haven't automated that yet, have they? <laughs> well, I I I learned how to do that on a. Lime, lime stabilization project, we couldn't get any uh, hubs in the ground. So I got a, a big roto hammer and put it on uh, just hammer and we would drive rebar in the ground. Okay. <laughs> and it, it worked really well. Sounds like you had some good times with that. It, it brings about a good hearty laugh out of you doing that. Uh, every once in a while, your voice uh, drops out, and I'm thinking you might be in a low, uh, low internet or le low Wi-Fi area. But uh, we'll we'll just keep going here. Tell you what, uh, talk about how things went after your appearance on his program. Um, what what started to happen afterward? Well, I saw the video, and was watching comments on it and the number of views. And it was like the lowest rating of all his videos for some reason. The least amount of views and, and not many comments. And nobody asked questions really. Oh, it's interesting. I made this screenshot today and it only has 18,502 views. So I guess you're right. Uh, a lot of these videos these guys do go up into the many tens of thousands, you know. Yeah, see, this one's two years old still. No, nobody's watching it. But Maybe they watched the next one. I'm going to just bring up the next picture uh, here. But I uh, had fun on, on on a Facebook post where somebody was giving me evidence of the flat Earth and. They had a couple weird, they used to say trains won't go uphill. <laughs> That's funny. I just rode the train from Durango to Silverton from 5,000 to 10,000 feet and 80 miles. That, that's pretty steep. Um, it just depends on how much weight you have on. And then he, he says, he cites that Mark Sergeant number 22 video says, well, here's a surveyor that just says it is. And I went, well, let me explain that. That's me. And you can't use that as evidence because I never said the earth was flat. I just said my projects were. So it was fun to shoot him down using, he was trying to use my own interview as the evidence against me. And which, now where was that on it? What show was that on? It may have been. Well, it was on a, a, a Facebook flat earth. Oh, okay. It was on Facebook. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, you know that he, he did have another su surveyor on a USDA surveyor. And after, right. after that yeah. one, I, I made this video to introduce the idea uh, to get people to understand that, you know, surveyors are working on a coordinate system. And it is usually state plane coordinates. And I, I go through the whole, just the basic rundown of that to introduce it to people. Um, and as you said, you, you were taking those coordinates and just localizing them to your project, you know, which makes perfect sense. It was, it was easier for me and other people could catch on to it because it, 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 everything wasn't the diagonal. 
which you'd never get in the real world. I guess so we could just summarize the fact that uh, it, you were you called in, he recorded the whole thing. Basically, you were all you were saying was that you did not take curvature into consideration. And that launched the memes that we see everywhere. Surveyors don't measure curve. <laughs> Surveyors yeah. don't measure curvature, right? Right. All right, so it's your fault. <laughs> well, it, it kind of is. It, and I told you that down in Louisiana, but I kind of, I kind of owe you for your troubles now for starting all this stuff. <laughs> it's no problem because uh, it's been fun. I mean, if it weren't for flat Earth, I would not be doing what I call now recreational surveys. Um, and I got that name from uh, another surveyor I've met on YouTube, who uh, who does incredible recreational surveying and uh, we plan to meet up and uh, and you know do some survey work together uh, especially when when I go and do the uh, I can show it to you I took my I want to go and do this uh, recreation of the uh, Maryland Delaware line which is uh, observer observing latitude at this corner and uh, We'll observe latitude here or here, probably here, but that's going to be that's going to be a load of fun. But uh, hey, what were you what were you about to say? Well, recreational survey. I hadn't even picked anything up. I got stuff packed away. But when you were going to Lake Michigan, I took my level to to Mount Baldy or whatever that is, and looked across the water and it just took me a couple seconds to see, wow, I'm way above the water. But there is some compelling stuff out there about mirroring and being too sharp of an angle to actually get the light waves. And it's confusing because there's, there's nothing to measure. Um, but when you have a building in the distance and you have the crosshairs, it's, it's dead obvious that you're standing on low ground near the water and you can see a, the top of the building at your crosshairs that that's level out there. I mean, your level's not lying. No, I was glad to see you post uh, those pictures in, um, in, our, in the uh, Facebook group, Flat Earth Camp Geodesy. Uh, we, I, we need more people doing that. And I agree with you. We see a lot of photography, a lot of uh, uh, vid videos of across water, of things off in the distance. And certainly the farther you go and under, under different atmospheric conditions, you're going to get all kinds of effects of looming and so forth. Uh, Soundly is doing amazing work actually studying refraction all day. He's, he's put a lot of time into... Uh, oh, with and, humidity and the sun and the temperature. Well, and, well, there's that, but he's also looking at the temperature of the water and the temperature of the air. And, he, uh -huh. and, he, and, he, and he, he's been doing it long enough now, he can actually predict what's going to happen based on those conditions. So he will see temperature inversions and he'll watch and actually record with these timed uh, time lapse uh, videoing you know, across Lake Pontchartrain or at Little Tinsus Bayou. So these are observable phenomenon. But like you said, if you uh, take a telescope out there, a surveying telescope, and set it at 90 or an auto level, um, that crosshair is, is a real, <laughs> represents a real measurable um, reference, which is... Uh, oh, no, no. And I would feel, I would use that as gold. You two peg your level, you tell it it's accurate, and I would use it at any distance that we're building. You know. Uh, well, that's uh, another we, thing. I mean, you're you're right. I mean, when you talk about uh, construction, you know, we use these instruments to put things places, like bridges and tunnels and and buildings and uh, you name it. Uh, or to measure the locations of things like mountains, uh, 
uh, power lines, uh, you name it. You know, these things are being either constructed or located to be placed on maps using surveying instruments and methods. Yet the flat earthers want to take uh, those very same things and say, oh, no, there's a distortion involved uh, due to perspective or magnification, you know, atmospheric magnification and lensing and all these other things. Well, then I keep saying this, that if that's true, then it equally applies to all of the surveying that took place to map everything. I mean, well, that, you can't have it both ways. Well, and if, if that's true, if you laid something out in the distance that was skewed because of whatever reason, and then you move yourself up there and it still measures out good, well, that means there wasn't any bad effects. If, if it still has the same dimensions when you get closer to it. Well, of course, uh, that's the whole, that's the whole thing. The things, yeah. the things that we are measuring are the size that they are. They, they don't literally shrink. They just appear to get smaller in the distance, but the dimensions are the same. Hey, uh, when we talked last, you mentioned you were heading back out here to Colorado someplace. Yeah, that's what I was, I was going to say that again in a minute. And, when uh, I was there, I never took my level out to, um, I looked at the mountains and stuff, but I was so close, it it didn't matter. I stood my, I stood my driveway, living, living on the, uh, the valley floor, which has a heck of a slope to it, but you get used to it after a while, it looks good. I, I set my level up. I'm looking down the driveway thinking I can see my house maybe. And well, I'm looking at the ground a couple hundred feet in front of me. That's how much of a slope there was from my instrument height. I'm looking at the ground long before what looks level by your eye. Well, that's a good point, John, that people can't constantly you uh, say, you know, the horizon rises to your eye level or other things having to do with eye level. And I've always maintained that you can't measure anything with your eye. And I think you just brought up a good point that seeing can be very deceiving. You know, looking can be deceiving. What you see doesn't necessarily, uh, <laughs> you know, it's not, you know, it's not level or it may appear to be level. In fact, there's places where you can go where it's very deceiving. It looks like it's going uphill and it's actually going downhill. You've seen those videos of oh, right, uh, Gravity Hills. Yeah, stuff like that. Hey, uh, where are you going to be going uh, the next time in Colorado? Well, fri I'm going to Ridgeway Friday, which is uh, uh, ten miles from Ure, uh, right in the right in the mountains. And I think I'm going to take my level instead of trying to borrow one because I know no mine's good, and go out the forty miles where you can see the see the mountain and it's about 5,000 feet elevation and look at a, a 10,000 foot mountain and see where my crosshair is. I'm going to pull up uh, Google Earth, which kind of takes a while to load because I've got a lot of uh, a lot of places saved. But um, I'm going to look guy, I'll, I'll look up. Guy, with me. That guy you talked to, Chris. Yeah. He kept saying, he kept using that diagram with the ball that he said he was standing at, at six foot. Yeah, he said he was over here. Can, can you see this? Yeah. He said he was like uh, over in this area where uh, the, two road, the two main highways split. I made a video about that the next day, uh, kind of reflecting on that conversation. And I, uh, I found this marker, which is the uh, the northeast corner of Colorado. It's an actual uh, geodetic marker. And he said he was looking at Long's Peak. And and like you said, he was putting into the uh, Metabunk calculator six for his eye height above the ground, which is not yeah, – not I'm, just, I'm just guessing he was at 4,000 feet. This is uh, 
let me see here. Well, this is Walter Bislin's app. This is the one of Philadelphia. He sent, uh, Walter sent me a, um, he did a simulation of where Chris was talking about. Let me go find that. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's nice to more people should, should uh, take a look at what Walter's doing. Uh, go to his uh, blog to see that. I thought about this a lot in the mountains, but he's basically just looking up up a slope, going from four thousand feet to ten thousand feet. You should be able to speed up. This is about what I mean. This this is what Chris was describing. That he could see the points of these mountains, and of course, he's trying to say you shouldn't be able to. Well. We can model it. If you can see it, it's there. You can see it. That whole, that whole thing about you shouldn't be able to see it needs. They need to back that up. What do you mean you shouldn't be able to see it? <laughs> anyway, so I, I think I'll leave the link to this in the description here. Well, what what happens to the Metabuck calculator when you punch in four thousand feet for a observer height? I don't know. I think it. I think it calculates correctly. I honestly, I don't. I don't use that calculator much at all. Um, well, I was. I was surprised because your your eye height is equivalent to an instrument height, and if you would set up a level, you wouldn't just put six foot as an instrument height everywhere you go. No, you have to. It, it has, oh, this is still not loaded. I want to find Ridgeway. Here we go. So wherever you say your eye height is, you need to say what your instrument heights would be. You need yeah, the elevation added in to the top of the ball earth. All right. Now I got an idea where Ridgeway is. So you're down in the south, south, southwestern part of the state. Right. That's, that's where you're going. All yeah. right. Does this look familiar? I'm having trouble seeing it. But... Yes. It's 62 and 550. Yep. That's, yep, that's right. And where do you think you're going to go to uh, to look at the mountain? Well, on north, uh, 30 miles to Montrose. Up this way? Past yep. Dallas? Yep, way on past the reservoir and um, about another 20 miles from there. Keep going. The problem is, you, you with so many mountains, there's not a good clear shot, straight on shot everywhere to get blocked by other mountains. So yeah, I mean you're in a valley here, right? Well, yes. Yeah, Ridgeway's in the valley, but if you go up to the next town up north, Montrose. Here we are. Yeah, that's pretty flat. And I believe it's down at at five thousand feet. I'm just ch uh, looking at the chat real quick, just to say hello to everybody. I've got my volume turned on, my audio is turned on. You can see my screen, making progress here. <laughs> I, I'm curious myself as to where the crosshairs are going to land. At that distance. Well, let's hear. I'm backing out a little bit from Montrose. Which direction are you going to be looking when you go? Well, south, toward, towards your A. All right, so you're going to be looking down this direction? Yeah, back where you started. But you're going to be in Montrose, right? Well, that's where I got to go to get my, my view. To be oh. far, far enough away that you can tell what's going on. 
Okay. Well, I'm, I want to hone in and maybe uh, find some uh, markers for you so you'll know what your elevation is. Ah. Good. That's that's what I'm about. That's what I want to do. Jesse, Colorado's different. Everybody that asks when you say you're from a town, yeah. The first the first question is, what's the elevation? <laughs> because we go from five thousand to ten thousand feet elevation, which changes weather patterns and all sorts of things. So. When you, come into, when you come into town, they don't tell you who the mayor is and the population. They, they tell you the elevation at every town. So it wouldn't be hard to get a close elevation, but it would be nice to have an accurate one. Okay. Well, shall we look for some markers? Yeah. Is this the area that you think you'll be in? Yeah. Right. Not in the on the left side of it. There's there's one big hill there with a cemetery up on top of it, but I think it's not what I, it's going to be too high. Uh, but anywhere in town. Okay, let's see what we get. While that's searching, I'm going to go back to the chat. Well, and there's an engineering company, an engineering and survey company there that I believe I can see the mountain from the street there. That I could just go in and ask them what's the elevation of the street out in front, and they, they ought to know. Let me say hi to some people. I want to say hi to Jared, John, Neil. Multi Tom Tom. Right. What is why is this taking so long? Come on, man. Don't fail this me now. This is just an idea, Jesse, but I think that Nikon ought to make a total station or whatever that has cameras built into it. So your party chief or whoever has the license in the office can actually see what the instrument man's doing. Uh, I think that exists. Oh, does it? What? This thing might be uh, no worky tonight. Let's try this again. Well, instead of trying to take pictures through your telescope, a guy could see everything that's going on remotely. Well, yeah, nowadays we're using drones. And, of course, yeah. we've been using laser scanners for a long time. And also uh, mobile LiDAR, that is uh, putting scanners on uh, vehicles and driving the roads and just scanning, you know, the crap out of the, the whole place. So uh -huh. there's a lot of really fast data acquisition technology being used. Here's uh, we have a lot of benchmarks. These are vertical marks. That, that means they were uh, established by differential leveling. I'll make sure I'll send you some of these and maybe just go uh, find one or two. There ought to be one on the bridge crossing the river on Main Street, just west of town. Here's an airport. All right. Well, we'll uh, we'll get back to that. I just wanted to show show you that. I'm going to save this. Let's uh, let's move along now. To I've I've shown this. Here's uh, Walter Bislin's blog. I'll put the link to this. That's in Colorado. And um, let's, uh, I guess we could start to wrap this up. We've been going about a half an hour, but I want to, uh, I want to show people some pictures of you and me when we first met. How's that? Yeah.
I want to say one thing. I watched you work, Jesse, and I took an elementary surveying class at Purdue, which covers a lot. But the reason I didn't continue with that field specifically, I just used it for general purpose, that it got really complicated. And it was <laughs> it was more than I wanted to invest at the time to learn that. It was over my head. And I didn't get it, and, but I knew enough to do plane surveying. And I never did any route surveying or hyper elevated curves or anything. Parking garages was the closest thing where you interpolate elevations between two known places. And that is the extent of my work. And I didn't get any further into it because it was so complicated. Well, I find the, the stuff that you do uh, pretty complicated too, man. So, you know, construction on, on construction sites, it's fast moving, things are changing. Uh, you gotta make decisions on the fly. I'm a slow thinker. <laughs> <laughs> I need I need time. I gotta collect data, look at it, analyze it, and come up with uh, with results. And you know, on a construction site, I mean, I've done construction surveying, but I'm just not drawn to it. So you know, I guess we each find our own uh, paths in life and our own interests, and we uh, you know try to make a living at, at something that we like. You know. So here's. Yeah, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that, that's pretty much it. Uh, I, I liked it because I had a knack for it, and there was a, a slot for me with just that limited knowledge. Well, you know, you must have, you've got a lot of construction projects behind you that you've, uh, you know, seen, you know, happen successfully and, uh, and are there. So, and, you know. And to be well, honest, when I first, when I first started, I had a mentor that kept encouraging me It said, trust yourself. Everybody's going to try to tell you you're wrong. Tell them to prove it. Because when you're not sure of yourself, sometimes you might listen to somebody else. And just starting out and beginning a project, I'd be wondering, is this going to work? Is this going to work? Is this right? And then all starts coming together, then you know for sure your original work was right. But a lot of times when I was doing it, I hope this is right. It it calps out, but you just you still don't know. And especially trying to connect concrete on a slope where you work from both ends towards the middle. Yeah. You have it come <laughs> well this turned out we know this turned out right and uh you did tell me you were coming up here and i was real surprised to see you and i was happy you showed up this is you and me uh out at little tinsis bayou in louisiana uh this is saturday morning and Here's uh, me and Soundly uh, down on the rocks. This is on the uh, eastern, I guess the yeah. eastern side. Uh -huh. That's the same place you finished up at. Yes, that was our last. This was uh, in that in the bitter cold and damp night, Saturday night. This is where we ended. Um, so let's see here. Here's us. Now here's this is me and Sally on the boat out on the water putting up the lanterns. All the lanterns were placed uh, nominally one mile apart and five feet above the water. And uh, this is, uh, we call this lantern zero. This was the first lantern. Mm -hmm. And here's uh, our method was to rope off. And when we got to each of these pillars and um, secure the boat, and then uh, and then start putting up the lanterns. And here's the eighth lantern. And then you know that's called lantern number seven. Remember that we start with zero, 
up to seven. This is the last lantern. To the east was the last one. Yeah, yeah. So now, uh, you know, it's starting to get, the sun is going down and it's very hard to see. So you were taking that flashlight, pointing the beam of light up through so that we could set the instrument up over the survey control points. And we got it all done pretty much in the nick of time before uh, dark fell. And uh, there's Lantern Zero at five feet. And the telescope crosshair is at five feet above the water. So basically, the other way to say that is we're looking level. The instrument is the same height above the water as the lanterns. So uh, it's just parallel. We have created a five foot line above the water surface. <coughs> and uh, so there's the first lantern. It's probably around maybe 200 feet away from the instrument, something like that. Right. And then here's you giving me light through the telescope so I could, so that it would illuminate the, the uh, crosshair, the reticle. Yeah, that was interesting doing that. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that's the only way to get it done. And this, this is the money shot here that, you know, will never get recognized by a flat earther because, you know, this is the Bedford level test redo, as Samuel likes to call it. The reboot is the uh, Little Tinsis Bayou level experiment. And uh, I think that maybe you, me, and Stanley should get together and do a an actual Little Tinsis Bayou uh, video, you know, or hang out and uh, – that would be fun. Would you be up for doing that? Oh, sure. This is the first time I've ever done this, and it's kind of fun. I'm, I'm still not very good at doing this, but uh, I'm, I do enjoy doing it, and I'm hoping to get better at doing it. I guess the only way to get better at it is to keep doing it. So I'll explain what's happening in this picture. This, pic this is the uh, one mile. This is lantern number one. Lantern number zero is way over here. So, you know, the telescope is set to be level. That is, uh, the zenith angle is 90 degrees. And so there's the first mile. And anybody that knows how to measure pixels could probably verify that that first lantern is below this crosshair by about, oh, let me take a guess, eight inches? <laughs> yeah. So here's the second mile. And there's no doubt about it. The lantern is below the crosshair. And I think the reason for that to the flat earther is um, perspective. I, I'm going to just take a guess. All right. And then, of course, this is the third mile. And even more, more perspective. <laughs> so, and of course, the fourth lantern. Wait, the fourth lan the fourth mile is underwater. Then the fifth, the fifth lantern is is nowhere to be seen. So, we get out to three miles, and. There's a, a, a no fourth lantern. And that, again, I'll remind everyone, this line is the same height above the water because the instrument is the same height above the water as the lanterns, five feet above the water. Well, you let me look. And I came out to not, not to to uh, verify your work, but I just wanted to see for myself. Yeah. I tell everybody, come out. You know, weeks in advance, we told everybody we were coming out here. People were welcome to come. Come out and see this for yourself. I'm encouraging uh, Jaron right now. I keep telling Jaron, you know, meet me at, uh, where is it? 
I want to show where the heck, here we go. I want to give a shout out to uh, George. Say his name, George Nack. Yeah, George Nack. Um, I, I, I'm trying to get up here. I want to go see him in April. I was trying to get there in March, but I can't. But uh, maybe uh, first or second week of April, I can come up here. I'm going to play a little bit of, a bit of this because I want more people to know about what George is doing on this frozen lake. But we'll we'll do that in one second. I want to finish these pictures. Um, th these are the lanterns, lantern zero, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there's eight lanterns. And these numbers represent the count between the, uh, the pylons or, or the columns. And they're literally spray painted on there. So we counted how many there were between each mile and it, and it really turned out to be a good way to do it. Um, so that's how we got our spacing. And I'm just finishing up with this uh, picture here. This is what I posted to Flat Earth Camp Geodesy uh, just to kind of memorialize this event and have us all there, you, me, and Soundly. And um, yeah, I, I, I think it would be a good idea if we scheduled a hangout and talked about, and maybe played a lot of the videos, you know, took some time and let people see what we did out here. And it was hard work and we worked hard and fast all day. And, you know, I left there not doing everything I wish that I could have done, but you know, we only had so much time. I was really interested in, and I think I mentioned it to you about the head pressure on the canal. Yeah. There has to be a slight uh, elevation to the beginning to have it flow down, to have it flow. Yeah. Well, right over here is the dam where this water's flowing, you know, in this direction. And it's not that much. No, it's very gentle. It's not, yeah, but that's, I mean, that's hydrography, right? Right. Um, all right, I'm going to close this, and let's listen to George a little bit. I, this was what he posted today. Oh, yeah? This map here shows the primary measurement line. Here is the home base the observation point where auto levels and the end lights will be set up and they'll be shooting in a northeasterly direction out across the lake here to home island in the Canadian waters. Uh, the shore of home island is uh, just a hair under six miles from the home base and there will be four marker poles and targets deployed out uh, essentially evenly spaced um, from the observation point out to the home island. Currently, I have the first marker pole here deployed and the one on Franzen Island deployed. This video will show the deployment of these two markers, plus uh, conducting an investigation into positioning uh, prism corner reflectors at each of these uh, marker points and shining a laser and seeing how much light gets reported back, whether or not I can hit these targets and get, have a, a reflection reported back to the observation point. The, this video will show uh, what happened when I show, show uh, shined a laser at this target, at the target at end of Franzen Island, and also a target uh, here six miles away on Home Island. So I want to show show him shooting that laser. Air temperature uh, seems to be fairly stable, and there isn't any uh, shimmer in the background. 
just so everyone knows what's going on, George has taken uh, this, these materials and created these targets and he has sized them so that they all appear the same size due to perspective. He used perspective to size the targets appropriately at the mileage that they are away from the observation standpoint. So uh -huh. at one mile, you know, the net, the second mile, the target is larger proportionally. Right. And then the third, and I think he's going to go all the way out to six miles. So each target gets bigger and bigger. And, but when you look at it through the telescope, they all look the same size, which is pretty cool. Now what yeah. he does, he, he's working by himself and he notes that this target needs to come up. And in this video, he describes the process. He has to snowmobile out here. He takes a guesstimation of how much to move it up and he gets it right. You know, he moves it up 19 inches or so, uh, uh, you know, and cinches it off again with the clamps and it's pretty cool. I think by the time I get there, he might have all this, all these targets are going to be set up. What were you saying, John? Well, you can estimate pretty good, no matter what your distance is with, with one known dimension. Yeah. You, if you know something's four inches, you can look right next to it and tell that that's close to four inches if it's the same size. Right. And that's what exactly what he's doing. He knows the size of the targets. And so he can estimate how much he has to move it up and he moves it up and then he comes back and he looks at it. And, uh, and he's spending a good amount of time out here working on this. Let's uh, I want to find the laser return. Here he is talking about the, the moving of the targets. Yeah. And that's the way the military analyzes pictures by getting d dimensions of things that you don't know by just identifying one known dimension. Right. Up in the sky. Uh. Now here he is putting the corner reflector. That's a prism corner cube, and he's uh, mounting it up here. I'll come up to about two and a half inches on the surface when uh, I'll hold the board in. I, I encourage everybody to follow George subscribe to his channel and look at what he's doing uh, and definitely do it before I get out there so that you'll see me <laughs> when I get out there. <laughs> well, he's definitely not having coffee. That's a lot of work. Oh, he's paying attention to everything. He's measuring temperature, pressure, humidity, everything. He's really gearing up. Oh, and I talked about soundly earlier about studying refraction. George, has been studying refraction out here um, like nobody's business. And he's, he's, he's uh, taking into account all the measurements necessary, temperature, pressure, the whole bit. And there's Khan, his doggy Khan. Jared's going to like this. Hey, Jared, there's Khan. <laughs> Jared, I have to say, Jared. Pretty, pretty sharp with a lot of things. Yes, he is. He's a good man. It's too bad that he okay. isn't he done? We're ready to go home. Hi, Con. All right. So, now watch this. After six, He's going to shoot the laser said now. About 15 minutes ago, I'm going to take the laser and see if we can hit the uh, corner reflector on the pole that's 1.32 miles away. Nice. That's the close one. Oh, wait, that's the far one. <laughs> and did he, did he mount all these higher and higher to uh, get them on the level line? Yes. Holy moly. Man, look at that. Effie Core has nothing on George. <laughs> Effie Coor should send their laser to George. That's what that, they should do that. 
Now here he's shooting the the real far one, I think, right about here. Hey, you know, we're about five minutes till the hour. I just want to kind of wrap this up. Uh, this is a teaser, people. Oh, this, this, I do want to talk about this. Here. I want to talk about See this. The laser hitting corner reflector. There is. He has the laser mounted on top of the total station. Axis here. Out of foot. Nice. Now, I think he's going to turn and uh, make a video of the instrument, I hope. I remember seeing it earlier. Today is March 2nd. And it's around quarter. There's uh, quite a bit of flickering occurring. This is the far one. Most likely due to atmosphere. Well, the the changes. middle one. This is the middle one. Bending the laser light beam. So as it's passing in front of the corner reflector, it's probably going on and off axis as the turbulence in the atmosphere changes. This is what I want to show. Okay, look at this. So he's got the laser mounted on top of his total station instrument. Okay. Now, the, the base I'm, is all leveled up. Say again? The base is level. Oh, yeah, this is level. Yeah. Now, well, I don't know if this beam's level right now because he's playing around. He's just kind of testing things. This is not the test. This is him just setting things up. But what I want to point out was that he put the laser on top of the theodolite. And this is something that Jaron Campanella, Jaronism, has asked for to see done. And he's, he's proposed this. And he's asked me, what would happen if you put a laser on top of a theodolite? And we, we had a very brief conversation about it, but we never finished it. And I hope to finish that with Jaron soon when we when we have a hangout we're going to meet and have a hangout and discuss all this stuff perspective surveying measurements the whole nine yards and he if i understood what he was saying he thought that this laser would cross down across the line of sight i could have misunderstood him i'll say that right now but i that's my understanding i think he was trying to say to me that the line of sight and this laser would cross or something. I didn't quite get it because in my, uh, to my understanding, we want to create a parallel line. The right. line of sight needs to be parallel with the laser. And that parallel line, you know, that you want to create a parallel relationship, not a crossing relationship. If it's crossing, something's wrong. That means something's not, hooked up correctly and and you've got a tilt right right yeah <sighs> anyway it's uh one minute till 10. john i want to I thank you a whole lot for coming on we we figured it out uh and let's do it again we'll schedule something with uh with soundly i'm sure he would love to do it we we keep touching on it we keep saying oh man we got to finish something to kind of memorialize what we did at, at uh, little Tensus Bayou, and we just haven't done it, and so it's 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 time at some point. <laughs> I don't know when. I will try to get. I will definitely get some pictures in the mountains. Oh, do that, please, and then we'll do a hangout. You you know, we'll show your screen. You're gonna have to do something about getting uh, some Wi-Fi because your your voice was coming in and out a little bit. But uh, even if you can't share your screen. If you give me the pictures, I'll put them on my end, and we yeah. can talk, we could talk about them. But uh, I'll send you some of those geodetic control points, and see if you uh, come across any of them and take some pictures of them. And uh, you know, for all we know, there they would be a good spot to see a mountain from too, because it's likely 
they were triangulation points that could see, you know, were seen from the tops of mountains and could see back to the tops of mountains. So, but I guess we will see about that. All right, sir. Uh, I guess I'm going to say bye to everybody in the chat. Thanks, everybody. Well, thanks for having me, Jason. Absolutely, John. And uh, thanks for coming on and clearing things up about the uh, the no curvature. <laughs> the, I guess I guess in the end, the joke and the hoax was on him, not you. It was on him. <laughs> he never did any more studying, or still won't acknowledge about surveying practice. So. Yeah. Well, until they, until they do that, you can't even talk to them. Right. So, okie right. dokie. I'm going to press the button. Good night, everybody. Thank you.